As long as you don't have me like here, going off the edge of the screen. <laughs> Are we ready? Can you open in prayer? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness and your goodness. Father, thank you for bringing us to repent. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for forgiveness of sin. Thank you for fellowship and this opportunity to get into your word right now. Lord Jesus, please uh, help Keith open up the scriptures to us and help us to learn from you through him and from each other and uh, help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of your son, Jesus. And please bless, bless the uh, rest of uh, this morning's worship service as well and the preaching and the teaching later on. And uh, this evening's service too, Father. Please bless the uh, members and guests and uh, regular and irregular attenders of First Baptist Church of Interlaken. And uh, help us to be a light and a pillar in the community. And uh, help us to help others know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Could you read um, in this verses 8 and 9 and then hand it off to Mary and she'll read the next Yes, I'm so, yeah, 8, 9, and 10, I'm sorry. 8, eight 9, and 10? Okay. Yeah. Jude chapter 1, verses 8, 9, and 10. Yet in the same way, these men, also by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority, and blaspheme glorious ones. But Michael the archangel, when he, disputing with the devil, was arguing about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men blaspheme the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct. Like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. <clears throat> woe, to, woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. And for pay, they have poured themselves into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, Wild waves of the sea, casting up in their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been forever, reserved forever. But Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, also prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deed, deeds which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lust, and their mouth speaks arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of their own benefit. Okay, so as, as we see, we're continuing in the book of Jude, and... Um, and this is the third section of it that we've been looking at. Um, the commentary uh, in MacArthur's study Bible um, calls this book or says this book is aptly referred to as the Acts of the Apostates because it's talking about just that. And in this situation, we're seeing a very strong denunciation, um, even to the point of actually referring to these apostates pretty much as subhuman in their, the, their nature and the way they behave. Um, first of all, we see them as rebellious dreamers and in um, verses 8 to 10. Somebody you want to read Second Peter 2.10. And especially those who go after the flesh 
in its corrupt lust and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they blaspheme glorious ones. Okay, and this, again, this idea of blaspheming glorious ones, blaspheming angels, um, he talks about that, starting in verse 8, say, talking about dreaming, that in this dreaming they defile the flesh. This is basically kinds of imaginations. These are dreams that, that this word is only actually used twice, and both of them refer in sense to a dream that is given from outside. Uh, one, Peter refers to the Holy Spirit in, in, in the um, day of Pentecost in his sermon when he refers to Joel, where he talks about old men will dream dreams. These dreams are from the Holy Spirit. In this case, I see this also as they're dreaming, but the source of their dreams is not the Holy Spirit. Um, and we know that we live in a supernatural world. So a lot of these dreams may be of supernatural origin, but they're not from God. Make of that what you will. In this case, though, these dreams that they have defile the flesh, lead them to reject authority and blaspheme glorious ones. So the idea of them being rebellious dreamers is a very important part of this thing, is that they're allowing what they're seeing or whatever, or their imaginations, to run away with them and lead them into very base things. We also see um, that they defile the flesh as we saw in this passage. Somebody want to read Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Hebrews 12, 14 through 15. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification with wi without which no one will see the Lord. Seeing to it that no one falls short of the grace of God that no root of bitterness springing up causes, causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. Okay, so we see here this idea of defiling the flesh is, is, is a progressive kind of a thing, um, where in this case he's talking about this root of bitterness defiling the flesh. In other words, this idea of us um, in bitterness, turning away from God and turning to acts of revenge. So these dreams also may be ideas of people getting revenge, saying, I'm going to get even with that person. And they spend their imagination on ideas of getting revenge as well as many other things. In other words, they, in their own human efforts, without relying on God, are going far from God. Somebody want to, um, we also see that they reject authority in this passage. And somebody want to read Romans 1.21. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. We see this, um, that they knew who God was or is, but they chose not to glorify him as God, but to try and ignore him. We see that today, especially in, in the atheism that is so loudly preached throughout us the United States especially, but basically the rest of the world, this idea that God doesn't exist. They knew God. They know for a fact that this world has a creator, but they deliberately deny that creator. 
and they're doing it purposefully. It's not like it's a, well, I, I don't believe. No, they know, but they choose to deny. They're rebelling. And this is leading them to defiling themselves. One of the reasons why so many college students went from going to Christian churches to, to um, believing it, that there is no God is primarily because they wanted to satisfy the lust of the flesh the free sex revolution back in the 60s and 70s had a lot to do with this, not just slow drift, it went from a slow drift to an avalanche of people turning away from God. There were many that turned to God also during the 70s, but the vast majority of people turned away from God and turned towards this idea of atheism because they wanted to have the fun without the consequences. And that's one of the things that's going on here. And we're seeing that that's what these false teachers are trying to do, is lead people into this idea. I want to have fun without the consequences. Only they are going to face the consequences. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19 says this. Therefore I say and testify in the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles walk. He's referring back to the fact that in 2 he said, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but you have been made alive by the Spirit. You have been quickened, as, as the King James puts it that he has made us alive, we are not to walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their mind and alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. because of the hardness of their heart. See, the hardness of their heart is what's causing them to reject the authority, to, to turn away from God's authority saying, you shall not sin, and to say, there is no sin. And they, having become callous, and that word is just like what you'd think it is. You know when you work with your hands and your hands are constantly rubbing up against a tool or whatever, you develop calluses on your hands to protect the skin? Well, that's what he's talking about here only. This is a callousness of our conscience. Our conscience bothers us, so he put a little layer of rejection over it. And then it bothers us again. And we put more, and pretty soon we have these big calluses protecting us from our conscience. And at one point, we get to the point where it doesn't matter anymore. And that's why you see us as human beings doing such things as the concentration camps in Germany and other things of that nature. We become completely callous and indifferent to the needs of those around us. And it says that once they've become callous, they've given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. See, that's the whole thing. It's that progression down that line that leads to abhorrent behavior. 
It starts off with an attitude. It ends up with an action. And that's important for us to understand. We need our attitudes to be right before God. Otherwise, our actions will not. The Bible talks about out of the heart proceed the issues of life. Out of from within us. And we need the Holy Spirit guiding our heart. Helping us to live by the law that he has written on our hearts. Then we see that they blaspheme what they don't understand, verses 9 and 10. And I want to read these over again because there's a lot in here. Verse 9 starts out by saying this, But Michael the archangel, hang on, let me, when he disputing with the devil was arguing about the body of Moses, so he's referring to after Moses died, Michael's there to claim the body and he's contending with the devil about it. And he said this, he did not dare pronounce against him a blasphemous judgment. He didn't condemn even the devil. But said, the Lord rebuke you. He allowed the judgment of God to be that rebuke to Satan. We see here that Jude is saying, and I'm going to quote an, uh, a poet from way back, who said, "Fear um, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And that's really what's going on here. The, the, these apostates have gotten so foolish that they're willing to blaspheme, but they have no right to blaspheme, but they have no understanding what they're doing. As a matter of fact, he goes on and he says this, but these men blaspheme the things they don't understand and the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals. He's likening these people that blaspheme things like that to unreasoning animals. They have no sense, no understanding. They have no conscience. And by these things, they're destroyed. That's how far they go. The Bible says that we, at one day, will judge the angels. And I believe a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have been attacked by Satan and his angels. As a matter of fact, we are being attacked on a fairly regular basis, even today. And I believe that we are going to be acting as witnesses for God's final judgment against them. That we will be standing there and we will have the right to say, I was attacked. And God is going to say, how dare you attack my anointed? David knew that. He wouldn't even go after Saul. Why? Because Saul was God's anointed, even though he was very disobedient. 
even though God had taken the kingdom away from Saul and given it to David, David dared not attack Saul. His conscience was his guide. And his conscience said, God anointed this man at some time in his life. I'm not going to say anything about that. I am going to allow God to deal with him in God's time. And that's what we will eventually see. God dealing with these issues in his time. Somebody want to read uh, 2 Peter 2, 11 through 13. Whereas angels who are greater in strength and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord, but these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, blaspheming where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed suffering unrighteousness as the wages of their unrighteousness, considering it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are, they are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they feast with you. And again, we're seeing Peter talking about people who are in the congregation and he's talking about them in the same way Jude is here. They have no conscience. They blaspheme what they don't understand. They're like unreasoning animals. And the wages they are going to earn is death. Somebody want to read 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And again, we're seeing here, this is Satan's long-term plan because that's the only long-term plan he has. Blind as many people to the message of salvation as he possibly can. They are perishing. And here's the thing. Even though these people may be apostate, even though they may be currently under God's judgment, our prayer should be that God will open their eyes and shine the light of his gospel that they may be saved. As long as they are alive, they haven't experienced the second death. And there is hope. We need to present the message both in word and in deed. And we also need to then pray that the Holy Spirit enlighten them and break through Satan's blinding powers, that they may also turn away from the darkness and to the light. We also see in verse 11, talking about rebellion, where he says, woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. They play, they pay. They have poured themselves into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. This rebellion is, is what happened in the wilderness. And this was when they were wandering and, and this whole idea Again, we're, I'm going to be looking in Hebrews, and I'm going to read this passage here. We're Hebrews 10, 26 to 29. Hebrews is a difficult book to sometimes parse out. Um, 
The author is giving some pretty dire warnings at times. And this is one of those warnings that he gives. And he says this, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy by the mouth of two or three witnesses. This is Old Testament law he's talking about here. Now, what about the New Testament? He says this, how much worse punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as defiled the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? Now, in these passages in Jude and in Peter, we see them talking about these apostates with us during the communion. They're trampling underfoot the blood of Christ. And the author of Hebrews is saying, how much worse is the judgment on those than on those who rebelled in the wilderness? See, we are held to a higher standard because we have a better knowledge of God's grace. A Bible teacher up in Canada when I was going there had this, he said this one time in terms of understanding of the scripture. He said, I'm not worried about what I don't know about the Bible. He said, I am concerned about the things I do know because what I do know, I'm responsible for. And that's what the author of Hebrews is getting at here. They're responsible, they know, and they are deliberately trampling underfoot the blood of Christ. They're walking on very dangerous ground. Then we see this idea of clouds without water. And he talks about that in verses 12 and 13, um, where it talks about men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts. When, when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water. You know, when I first read that, I was thinking about Elijah when the clouds came and they didn't have any rain in them. And really, that is what's going on here. Somebody want to read 2 Peter 2, 17 through 19. These are springs without water and mist driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been kept. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by sensual lusts of the flesh, those who barely escape from the ones who conducted themselves in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. They are making promises not only can they not keep, but they're making promises that are totally contrary what they themselves are experiencing here. Empty promises. They're saying, you can be free from the guilt of sin. 
Well, in a way, you can be callous towards the guilt of sin, but that guilt is still there, and that guilt is going to end up enslaving you in sin to start with and delivering you to judgment to finish with. These promises they make, they can't deliver on because they're not God. And they themselves are enslaved by the very sins they promise to deliver you from. Then we see in, in verses 14 through 16, the judgment of the ungodly grumblers. Somebody want to read 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10. Since it is right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give rest to you who are afflicted, and to, you, and to us as well at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, executing vengeance on those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have been believed, for our witness to you was believed. Notice here at the very beginning, it says it's right for God to replay, to repay those who afflicted you. And as I said earlier, talking about us being witnesses against the angels who attack us, who afflict us. And he's saying very clearly here, it's right for God to repay that. God is the righteous judge, and he will judge. There's no escape. The only escape we have is through the blood of Christ. We have that option. And I thank the Lord, he opened my eyes to see it, that I may walk through that door of salvation. And each one of us can walk through that door if we haven't already. And that's the true hope we have. That by the door, Jesus himself saying, I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he will come in. We can come into that salvation because Jesus not only is the door, but he made it an open door. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the work you did on the cross and for your resurrection and your resurrection power in our lives. We pray that you would help us to walk in that resurrection power, that by your grace we may point people to the open door of your salvation that we may point them to you who said, I am the door. If any man come to me, he may enter and I will sup with him and he will sup with me. We just pray that you'd help us to truly be the light that guides, that light which is a reflection of you who are the light of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.